It is 5 o'clock. Uh, once again, uh, the time we come together. I was reminded today one of the reasons that we come together. It was after an interview with um, DuPont Manuals, a uh, uh, newspaper multimedia group. Uh, it's, it's not just about an update. It's about reconnecting. It's about coming together at a time where it's very difficult to get together. It's about sharing our anxieties. It's about sharing our fears. It's about letting ourselves be vulnerable because we all feel the same. And it's about recommitting to defeating this virus, but also remembering that we're going to get through this and we're going to get through it together. So say it with me. We're going to get through this. We're going to get through this together. One last time. We're going to get through this. We're going to get through this together. That's going to be the best known uh, uh, sign language, I think, in Kentucky by the time we're done, Virginia. Uh, by the way, congratulations on the bobblehead. Uh, it is well-deserved, both for you and for what it represents. So we're excited about that. Uh, we're going to get through this because we have shown that we can take those basic guidelines, that we can take uh, the, the science, that we can take the advice from public health, and we can make it a part of our everyday lives. Uh, that's why we talk about the rules for being healthy at work, because I know you already know the rules for being healthy at home. And so when you look through and you think about these rules, these are the things that make us safe. Let's talk today about on-site temperature and health checks. You know, there are different things that uh, people may at different times object to. I mean, some people have objected to masks. And the challenging part about that is you can object to a mask on your own you know, personal health, but it's not your own personal health that it's going to impact. It's other people's health. So it's more about your willingness to protect other people if you're wearing or, or not wearing one. But temperature checks are one that are so important because shame on us if we miss that blatant sign that somebody might be infecting other people. If you think about it, so many people are asymptomatic that many times we can't see and we can't know when somebody has the coronavirus. But by doing a temperature check, it means that if you are going to a place of business and you are healthy, that we can at least hopefully identify somebody that didn't know they have it, didn't know they had a fever. They don't want to walk in and infect other people and you don't want them to uh, either. So just one really common sense step, again, pushed by the White House, adopted um, uh, by us here in Kentucky, uh, and one we need businesses, individuals, and everybody else coming together to say, well, this is just smart. Now, we have these tools. Let's make sure that we are smart in the way that we are addressing uh, COVID-19. <clears throat> so we talk about the 10 steps, and we talk about our 11th. Fill out your census. We are still in 13th place. I don't like being stuck in the rankings. I don't know about you. None of us are ever excited when our teams are just stuck in the rankings. So let's fill out the census. Let's make sure that we get the federal dollars that should be coming to Kentucky. It's incredibly important for our next 10 plus years, billions upon billions upon billions of dollars. Let's make sure we do this just a couple minutes to be a good citizen. Outside of this, uh, what we've asked is for people, especially after we are going back to work, trying to be healthy at work, to fill up social media with the types of, of behaviors that we really need to see. These are the hashtags we use, they keep growing uh, because our approach uh, has to be fluid. We have to do what it takes to defeat this virus and healthy at work is our newest hashtag. So let's see what we have today. Yeah, this is pretty neat. This is um, uh, these two individuals, uh, Jasmine and I believe her sister, uh, talking about their grandmother who was diagnosed with stage four lung cancer uh, that had metastasized to her brain. Uh, four years ago, she had beaten the odds and now they know that she's vulnerable especially to something like COVID-19. Now, a lot of our loved ones out there are in these type of situations, vulnerable to it. So look at them, both wearing their masks, 
both making sure they're staying on the other side of the glass. Don't we owe it to them to also wear a mask? Don't we owe it to them to do things the right way, knowing that it could impact their loved one? I think we do, and they're setting a really great example. All right, this is State Representative Kelly Flood, who has just gotten tested uh, at the Walgreens location uh, in Lexington. Very quick to sign up, got through uh, the drive through and getting the results back very quickly. Representative Flood is setting the example. We have the capacity now, but you need to get tested. You need to get tested because we need to know if you have the virus, and it's going to be a lot of peace of mind for you to know that you don't. But we also need you to get tested because that helps us know uh, about the general amount of, of asymptomatic people that are out there, something little that can help all of us. All right, this is healthy habits turning into a healthy lifestyle. Just because we're healthy at home and healthy at work doesn't mean we can't get out and be physically healthy. I know there's a worry that uh, that COVID-19 can lead to obesity, given that uh, we're not out and about as much. But this family has run uh, the marathon together that they otherwise would have run in Bowling Green. You know, now's a chance. I mean, surely we can watch this virus that is deadly to those that aren't healthy enough and say, let's all get healthier. Uh, let's all get in better shape. I know I'm trying. It can be hard uh, during these times, uh, but we ought to take this is a lesson, as a lesson out of COVID-19, that the healthier that we get, the more resilient we will be if we ever see this again or something like this in our lifetime. All right, so this is in Adair County with uh, Family First setting up a new drive through testing site. Community leaders, community organizations coming together meeting this testing challenge it's been special to 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 see and i like that phrase they have up there in the background uh, and here is lost river cave again standing with all of us with the community uh, uh, that they serve knowing that uh, there are many lost loved ones out there and we're going to lose more people as we go forward it's a time where it's very hard to uh, to, to come together for our grief. So let's make sure uh, that we light our houses and our places of business and our landmarks up green to honor those that we have lost. So we've tried to take positive lessons through this where we can find them. And one has been how we include everybody, which is why we have been learning sign language. And so today what we're learning is you be safe. All right, you be safe. You be safe. One more time. You be safe. Thank you, Virginia. All right, to our numbers today. And today is one of those days where there is, um, yeah, sorry, right before we get to that, um, we did have something uh, pretty special today. Um, this is a, a video of some of our faith leaders. I believe they're all uh, Presbyterian, Presbyterian ministers uh, talking about the reason that they wear masks. I know for me, a large part of it comes from faith, comes from living the golden rule of making sure that I am protecting and loving my neighbor uh, as I would myself or my own family. Wearing a mask is how I show I love my neighbors. Wearing a mask. Is how I protect the vulnerable. Wearing a mask is how I show love for my neighbors. Wearing a mask is how I show I love my neighbors. Wearing a mask is how I show I love my neighbors. Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. This is the way I'm loving my neighbor these days. Love does not seek its own way. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. I love my neighbor, so I choose to wear the mask. 
Wearing a mask is how I show that I love my neighbors. Wearing a mask is how I show that I love my neighbor. My mask says I love you. S spread love, not germs. <laughs> Wearing a mask is how I show I love my neighbors. Wearing a mask is how I show my neighbors I love them. I wear a mask not because I'm afraid. I wear a mask not because I lack faith. I wear a mask because I love my neighbor. I'm wearing this mask because I love my neighbors. You know, these can be hard, difficult, lonely times that feels like they have dragged on, but I know many of us out there, me included, have, have turned to our faith uh, during this time even more uh, to push us forward. Uh, the, the leadership that our faith leaders have shown has been uh, incredible. Um, they have done things that they never expected that they would have to do in, in their leadership roles. Uh, and, you know, I mean, my faith teaches me that if it protects other people, that I will do difficult and uncomfortable things uh, because I also love my neighbor. All right, our numbers today um, are uh, both good and, and bad. Um, the good side uh, is that our number of cases uh, are down right about where uh, that plateau uh, has been 164 new cases. And after the last several days, duplicates, um, out-of-state folks are removed. It brings our total number of cases to 8,069, 8,069. 90 of those are probable, so that's another reason the numbers change in that um, they will become at some point lab confirmed uh, or not, um, uh, hopefully. Our new cases by, by county are 50 in Jefferson, 33 in Fayette, 22 in Warren, 10 in Kenton, 7 in Boone, 3 in Campbell, Davis, Hardin, and Oldham, 2 in Allen, Bullitt, Franklin, Grayson, Logan, Ohio, and Shelby, and 1 in Boyle, Breckenridge, Callaway, Carter, Christian, Clay, Edmondson, Henderson, Henry, Hopkins, Madison, Muhlenberg, Nelson, Simpson, Whitley, and Wolf. There are now very few counties that haven't had at least one case. Is that of a total number now tested? 153,800. I think that's about 8,500 plus up uh, from the other day. Again, our testing number significantly increasing. Uh, that's a good thing, and it's going to help us uh, to be safer uh, going forward, and it's something that I am so thankful uh, for uh, having now lived through not having enough tests, not having uh, tests at all originally to a, a brand new virus to where we are today. Total number of Kentuckians ever hospitalized, 2010, currently 443, ever in the ICU, 875, currently 269, and number of recovered, my favorite number, 2,826. But then there's the really tough news, and that's that today we have lost, I believe, more people to the coronavirus than, than on any other day before. Uh, we're announcing that we've lost 20 Kentuckians today. Some of this is, is based on the reporting times of other counties uh, or, or of areas, but we haven't announced these 20 individuals. And so while I believe that we can reopen and reopen safely if we do it gradually, let's remember this thing's still deadly, and it's still taking people we love and care about. And 20 is a, is a hard number. That's a tough number. It's better than numbers that many of our neighbors may read off on a daily basis, but these are my people, these are your families, and we never want to see, um, we never want to see losing 20 Kentuckians in a given day. Um, each one of them is more than, uh, than an age and a gender 
and a county. But I'm going to read that information for, for all 20 of them. Start with an 80-year-old man from Davis County, an 88-year-old male from Logan County, an 83-year-old male from Edmondson County, a 76-year-old female from Davis County, an 87-year-old male from Edmondson County, an 80-year-old female from Edmondson County, a 70-year-old male from Campbell County, an 84-year-old female from Kenton County, a 61-year-old male from Allen County, an 88-year-old male from Warren County, an 89-year-old female from Kenton County, 84-year-old female from Jefferson County, 84-year-old male from Boone County, 93-year-old female from Boone County, 83-year-old male from Adair County, 76-year-old female from Adair County, 83-year-old female from Adair County, a 60-year-old a 60-year-old female from Logan County, a 77-year-old female from Jefferson County, a 63-year-old male from Breckenridge County. 20 Kentuckians today, tough day. Let's make sure that just like every day, we're lighting our homes up green, that we ring our bells tomorrow at 10 a.m., that we don't get tired any night or any day from doing the right thing to, to honor uh, these families. And you look at some of these communities and the loss they've suffered with uh, Dare County and Edmondson County today, Northern Kentucky, the Owensboro region. Now it's, it's hard and it's hit some areas harder than others and harder than it ever should. And to those counties and to these families, uh, we want to grieve with you. We want to be there for you that this is a one in every hundred year worldwide health pandemic, but it doesn't make your loss any less. And we know it's harder to grieve. So we are thinking about you. We want to help you. It's a, it's a tough day on, uh, on this side uh, in, in Kentucky. Um, going through the um, ethnicity and, and race of known cases on ethnicity, 86% non-Hispanic and roughly 14 percent Hispanic and on race 74 uh, percent white 14.8 uh, percent black or African-American 5.87 percent Asian 5.26 percent multiracial on deaths where again today is a hard day 97.73 percent non-Hispanic and 2.27 percent Hispanic that's ethnicity on race, 77.74% white, 18.9% black or African American, 1.83% Asian, 1.52% multiracial. Let's look at long-term care facilities where a number, but not all, of today's reports came from. Now uh, 1,116 residents have tested positive. That's an addition of 12. 32 additional staff and this is because we are testing everybody at these facilities remember this was our week with 3,000 plus tests and what we're finding out whether it's uh, a prison or a long-term care facility or or anywhere else when we test all the staff we have a lot of asymptomatic staff which makes it really important that we test to make sure we're not further spreading things uh, in facilities uh, and then we have seven additional deaths all seven are residents, four additional facilities that have at least one uh, positive. This continues to be uh, the challenge, though I believe that what we have going right now um, is, is one of the best efforts in the country at protecting um, our individuals that are in long-term care, and we are going to make it to every single one of those facilities, uh, which is our goal. Uh, before I talk about Healthy at Work, given Given some of the numbers today, uh, I'm going to ask Dr. Dr. Stack to talk about Memorial Day. Um, starting on Memorial Day, people um, before Memorial Day Friday are going to be able to have groups of 10 uh, or less over. Now, we can do this, and we can do this safely, but we need to be really careful about it. And I know, Kentucky, uh, that you can do it. Uh, but I think it's helpful to have some pointers uh, and to have some additional knowledge about how we do it. Uh, you know, my, my dad, um, in some of the biggest moments of my life, uh, gave me some really interesting advice. He'd say, son, 
This is really important. Don't screw it up. Well, this is our first chance to get together with people uh, that we uh, have missed. Uh, and this is our first chance to have a lot of additional contacts that are out there. You know, we want to reopen our economy. We want to get things uh, 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 humming again in a safe way. This weekend, we can't screw it up. We've got to make sure uh, that we follow the best guidelines and that we learn uh, from where mistakes have been made. So with that, Dr. Stack. Virginia, thank you, Governor. James, if you could put the first slide up. So I'm going to set the context here to lead up to the guidance for um, uh, oh, the the, um, the other one, the, uh, the gatherings one. So I'm going to set the stage here for what we're going to give you for the guidance for uh, 10 people or less gatherings as you go into Memorial Day weekend. So the CDC, the federal government's Centers for Disease Control, so the national experts on uh, disease management, released today a new report. This is not unlike last week. I had a different infographic that talked about the spread of disease in a group setting. This one came out today, shared an uh, example from Arkansas, where two individuals went to, it happens to be a church service, but I'm going to make the point here in a minute, it's not just churches. So went to a church service before they had symptoms. They didn't know they were sick. They didn't think they were infecting people. They, I highly doubt they had any intention of causing any harm. They went to the church service. Uh, before the first individual developed symptoms, um, uh, was it a Bible study gathering? They went home, he developed symptoms. They shut the church down shortly after this. As a result of those two individuals, it was a married couple, I believe, um, 35 of the 92 attendees at church, at least 35, developed co coronavirus infection. So that's about a 38% positivity rate. That means over a few day period before the first individual developed signs of infection, spread the infection to at least one third of the people they could identify he had come in contact with. Of those third that got infected, three died. All right, so three people died as a direct result. But here's the thing, so we, we can talk about making choices that affect ourselves or we can accept what risk we take for ourselves. But look what happened next. Because those individuals who subsequently got infected were out in the community, they spread the infection to at least 26 additional people, and one of those people died. So here's the problem. Our actions, our individual actions, have direct implications and consequences for others. So when we talk about what kinds of acts of love and caring and kindness we can do, even though it's inconvenient. I don't like wearing a mask in public any more than anyone else does. It is something we choose to do because it's what we need to do to keep ourselves and to keep the people we love and to keep the others around us safe. So I'm going to leave this up here for one more second while I tell another thing because it's not just about church services. It's about any group gatherings. It just so happens these are the examples that have been published in the last two weeks. So in Southern California and Pasadena, about a week and a half ago there was news coverage about a birthday party, and the birthday party was held um, in a private home, and it happened indoors and outdoors, and one member of the birthday party came and was coughing and having signs of a respiratory infection. Uh, people were not wearing masks, they were not practicing social distancing, and as a result, five people tested positive related to that birthday party, and there were other people who had symptoms but who did not get tested. Now this was um, as I understand it, earlier in April when testing was still harder to come by, so not everyone may have gotten a test. So our actions have direct implications on the health and safety of others. So James, if we could show the new slide on gatherings. So this weekend is the first time we're going to permit in Kentucky for, for the last two months or so gatherings of up to 10 people. In order to do this safely, in order to minimize the risk of infection being spread from people to people, and in order to keep people safe and, and not place people in risk of serious illness or even death, we have to do these things. And they're the same things we've been telling you for quite a while. And we're going to keep repeating them because they're so important. Um, if at all possible, hold the gathering outside. There's a lot more air circulation. It's less likely that the virus will be floating in the air or concentrating. Continue to practice social distancing. Keep more than six feet between yourself and other people. So you can have a smaller gathering, just stay further away from each other. Uh, do it outside on a deck, on a patio, in the backyard. 
if at all possible, wear your cloth face covering. So whenever you are together, whenever you are likely to uh, be anywhere near the six feet barrier, make sure you have a cloth face covering on. It keeps you from spraying secretions towards other people and spreading infection. And remember, people without symptoms can have infection and spread it. So you may not even know you're spreading it. Don't share food and don't share utensils and plates. And so just be careful. Take care of your own plates. Wash them off. Put them in the dishwasher. Wash your hands often and have hand sanitizer available for people so they can use that when they can't go wash their hands. And avoid touching your face, your eyes, your nose, your mouth. All of those are portals where you can inject infection into yourself. So um, it's Memorial Day weekend. Uh, I know many of us desperately crave the company of our, our family members and our friends. Um, I hope you have a wonderful Memorial Day, but I urge, I urge and I ask that everybody please follow these steps so that we can stay safe together uh, and not have uh, serious consequences none of us want as a result. Uh, thank you very much, Governor. So our goal here uh, isn't to scare people, though, I mean, it's a scary time. Uh, it's to make sure that we give the best guidance we can because none of you want the first time you're able to get together to, to lead to health complications for anybody. So uh, we're going to continue to talk about this this week. There is a way that you can do this uh, safer, uh, hopefully safely. Uh, we just really need you to buy in. Uh, to, to follow these steps so we can make sure uh, that folks can truly be healthy while uh, doing it. And remember, there are just some of the things that we can't be doing uh, that, are, that are here. Uh, and the more that we can make this, again, a part of our everyday routine, the more we'll be able to do uh, going forward. Uh, let's turn from that to um, some, some uh, additional positive news. Uh, our next announcement on Healthy at Work is about June 8th as we look forward. Um, on June 8th, um, uh, here are some of the additional openings that we will be able to do. We're going to have guidance up uh, soon, museums, outdoor attractions, uh, aquariums, libraries, distilleries. Uh, we're going to try to have as much guidance that's applicable to a lot of these because some of them uh, are 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 outdoors but also have individual tours or groups uh, that can go through so we're going to be working hard on this but this gives uh, these businesses uh, some advance notice they're still going to have to meet the top 10 rules and then we're going to try to have some specific guidance for them so this can be done uh, safely can you go to the overall uh, events may and june so this is a big week right this week uh, we've seen government offices uh, start to open back up. That doesn't mean they're all open to the public yet. Um, funerals are, are now able. We're going to be able to do them on um, starting tomorrow on, on a slightly uh, bigger level, but we got to do it safely. Retail opens tomorrow. That's a really big day. On Friday, restaurants and the ability to get together with 10 or less and then look at Monday. I know people have really been looking forward to everything that's, that's there. This is going to be a lot of additional activity. And we just got to make sure that we do it safely. But I trust in you. Uh, we have been so good thus far. You have done so well thus far that I believe that we can do this safely. But it's got to be differently. If we just go about it the way that we did before, it won't work. We'll have to repause our economy. And we know how detrimental that can be. Uh, so uh, let's get it right. Um, and uh, according to... Uh, uh, the advice that, that I've gotten it many times in my life, let's not screw it up. Let's make sure uh, that we again prove that Kentucky can do these things better than just about anybody else. How about some more good news? Let's talk about testing. So, again, we've gone from uh, there not being tests for this virus to now, look at that, sites all over Kentucky to there being no excuse for anybody not to get tested. And today, we're announcing that starting this Friday, our partnership with Walmart is going to expand. As some of you all know, uh, we've been uh, testing with our partner with Walmart in Louisville for several weeks, and that we just added the Bardstown location, something that that city knew it needed, uh, and, and we were able to, to step up and work with them. Today, we are announcing additional locations 
permanent locations in Ashland, Bowling Green, Litchfield, London, Paducah, Pikeville, and Richmond. Again, these are uh, areas that we've had some service in, but we can use multiple locations. Uh, they're areas where we needed additional testing. Uh, we really appreciate uh, Walmart and their partnerships, and these partnerships have been really helpful for us. So when we think about you know, what we need to combat this virus, we need to continue our social distancing, we need the testing capacity, which we now have, and we need tracing, which we are putting together that infrastructure as we uh, went over uh, yesterday. So some tough news today, you know, 20 deaths, that's hard. Um, some uh, um, normal news, our number of cases where it's back down to, and some good news in new testing and what we think we'll be able to do for, for healthy uh, at work. Now, uh, on the testing front again, before I leave it, our Kroger drive through sites, which are our highest volume testing. Again, um, we have more spots available. First of all, Louisville, Shawnee Park's done a really good job. After last night, they filled up uh, those te testing sites. We just need people to show up. No more no-shows, but otherwise, good job. Uh, Richmond, whole lot more um, after talking yesterday. It looks like we are really close, about 50 more spots on Thursday. Ohio and Graves County continue to have a lot more spots available, uh, almost 400 spots in Ohio County tomorrow, Wednesday, and Thursday, which means if you're anywhere in the area and you go online uh, tonight, you can get a test tomorrow or Thursday. We need you to do that. Graves County, the same way. The way they've been hit, even if you think they're in long-term care facilities, there's a way it got in there, and there's a way it gets out of there. So we really need you to get tested. Graves County, 300 more tests available on Wednesday, 400 more tests available on uh, Thursday. Our ability to do the high volume sites in different areas around the state is dependent on people signing up for it. You want your area to be as safe as it can. I know we all have prides in being Kentuckians, but I know we also have prides in being Western Kentuckians or, or Eastern Kentuckians. And so let's make sure that we do our civic duty. We get tested uh, to make sure that our area can be as safe as it can. And remember, as we step into contact tracing, and we're going to be talking about it more, your duty as a Kentuckian, as a patriotic American, is to answer the call. We're going to live. We're going to reopen in a time of contagion which means that we all have to do our part if we've been contagious or if we've been exposed to someone uh, with it. This is all of us working together to reopen our economy, and reopening it depends on all of us, all of us doing the right thing. If a small fraction of us don't and spread the virus, guess what? The rest of us pay for it. But if we all do the right thing, we can do this really, really well, and I think we can move forward uh, with a strength that we won't see in many other areas of the state. All right, so today we have four uh, journalists joining us. We have Tom Latek, we have Joe Ragusa, we have Lawrence Smith, we have Joe Sanka, and then I have a series of questions like every day that have been submitted. We'll do um, 30, we'll do 25 minutes or, or a little bit uh, less. Why don't we start with you, Lawrence? The uh, new openings that you mentioned today starting June 8th, what uh, are the guidance for those? So the capacity limits, things like that? Uh, so the, the June 8th openings, uh, we are still working on the guidance, but we know with the, with the top 10 rules that we need to give people a little bit of advance notice to start meeting the basics, and then we work on the, the more specific uh, guidance. Um, there will be capacity limitations everywhere, and in places like distilleries, there will also be uh, sub-limitations just like there are in restaurants. So right now, restaurants have an overall capacity and then how big your party can be, you know, 10 and under. Uh, same thing will be for, for a tour, for instance. And some of those um, lend themselves to being able to control that a little bit easier than, than others. Uh, but we're trying to not wait until we have the specific guidance when we know that, that it does take work uh, to get ready uh, for this. All right, Phil Pendleton. Does the one person per household rule that's been in effect for essential stores also apply to retail stores opening Wednesday? So this is always a hard rule to enforce, but it's one that we want to highly encourage everywhere. 
it's both good for the stores because if they have an overall capacity limit and you bring in your entire family, they get less shoppers. Uh, but it's also uh, really important because uh, the more that we can cut down on the group or the social setting, uh, the safer that it can be. Now, when we go into stores, shop, browse, but it can't be social. These have to be experiences where we get in, we get what we need, and we get out. That's how we open retail. That's hopefully how in the future we expand capacity. But it needs to be what we call a transitory experience, in and out, and not one of long duration. You know, right now the experts are saying that the risk, and, and everybody's got to think about their risk when they do any of these things, are about the amount of time you're at some place um, and, and the level of contacts that you'd have and how enclosed uh, and dense that place is. So think about uh, all of those. Joe. So the questions about reopening and with our cases, our, our, our numbers of positive staying about the same, what am I looking at? What would cause me to, to, to pause? Uh, let me say that while our number of cases has, has plateaued, um, our, our rate of infection has gone down according to just about everybody who tracks it. We have a smaller percentage uh, of people uh, that, that are testing positive, and, and part of that's because Originally, we were only testing people who we thought would, would test positive. But it is giving us a better idea of the prevalence uh, of, of this virus as it's out there, both in symptomatic and in asymptomatic uh, folks. Um, our hospitals continue uh, to have sufficient room in beds, in ICUs, and in ventilators. That's something that we are absolutely watching now. Remember, one of the reasons we took the the, the drastic steps that every state took uh, was concern that it would overwhelm our health care capacity, and it would have if we didn't take those steps. And one of the reasons that we're doing our reopening gradually is to make sure that we don't hit a stage where we're overwhelming uh, any of that capacity. So we, we look at hospitalization, uh, we look at ICUs, we look at numbers of people uh, on those ventilators. We, we look not just at quantity, but a little bit of the other information and how serious uh, are these cases that, that we're seeing. Uh, but right now, um, we're going to be watching, of course, what's happened from this last week. Though you can't just, some of the national stories are, well, somebody reopened two weeks ago, meaning the very first day <laughs> that people were doing new things was two weeks ago. Well, they might have been on, people might have been on their best behavior on day one, but what about day five? So a lot of this we got to watch in, in real time. Uh, but we'll be watching all the indicators because our goal uh, is to do the very best for our people. Okay, have I said from Valerie and, and Daniel at the Herald Leader when summer camps will open? So on June 15th, and we're hoping the guidance is out by the end of this week, child care uh, is going to reopen. And if camps can meet the requirements of child care, and they're going to be some pretty significant requirements, but they're going to be very similar to some other states. Then they can also reopen. It's going to be a challenge in some instances. Now, summer camps that involve sports will also have to meet the sports requirements because there's different levels of contacts uh, within sports. Uh, but basically, those, those uh, summer camp, child care, we're going to have the same types of regulations out there uh, that need to be met. Mainly, that's going to be a, uh, a capacity uh, level of any individual class or group, how small it can be, and it can't come into contact with other groups. Now, that doesn't mean you can't run multiple groups if you can ensure that they don't come into contact with each other. It's trying to put a bubble around that number of kids and their contacts as they have uh, with, with parents. And let me quickly, live performances, bingo halls, um, no guidance out yet no date out yet. Concerts, uh, you can do the drive-in 
and drive up like we have done uh, in worship services before uh, recent uh, uh, steps we've been able to take. Bingo halls, no date yet. Um, there's a lot of issues to, to work through there. Joe? Uh, CMS uh, put out new guidance for state and local governments yesterday on reopening nursing homes to, vis to visitors. Is there any timeline yet on when that might come? Any guidance? Uh, the question's on CMS putting out uh, guidelines on allowing uh, visitors back in. Uh, we need to see a stabilization, especially in our nursing homes. We need to get through the testing uh, to make sure that we can uh, know um, how much COVID is or is not in any given facility because there's both the risk of bringing it in and the risk of, of taking it out. So we're going to have a lot more data over the next two uh, to three weeks. Uh, we know how important visitation is, but we also know how deadly that this virus uh, can be. So we want to continue to encourage uh, virtual visitation, visitation through glass at, at the windows. Uh, if we can loosen up uh, some of that, but we need to be really careful. Because remember, one person infected going into a nursing home can cause some real significant devastation that you can't undo. Uh, so we'll be looking through that guidance. Uh, Eric Freelander, I know, is, is leading our charge along with Dr. Stack on protecting our, our nursing homes and long-term care facilities. Can I give an update on the Team Kentucky Fund? 9,314 applications have been started. 1,251 are complete. Uh, that would be slightly more than a million dollars requested in applications. We hope that we will get those dollars out soon uh, so that we can use this money uh, to help people. Remember, you can give tax-free to the Team Kentucky Fund. It's going to go uh, to help people all across Kentucky, uh, things like rent or, or, or other hardships that, that people have been suffering uh, through this. We want to do everything we can uh, to help everybody make it through. Remember, this is temporary. We don't know exactly when the vaccine is coming, coming but we know it's temporary. And our hardship is temporary, too. We have plateaued a pandemic like no one ever has. We can and we will rebuild our economy. Uh, the unemployment, temporary. We will rebuild. We will reboot. I have confidence in you, and I know that we can do this. Tom, did you just ask a question? Uh, no, I'm round. Ready to. All right, <laughs> go for it. <laughs> okay. um, I've had uh, people ask me, when will the state police resume giving the driving tests? Hmm. We don't have a, a set date for uh, resumption of driving tests. We are working through a number of different options about renewals of driver's license. So this is one of the things where we had to get governments back in the office to start working through the processes of it being open to, to, to the public. But uh, to all those 16-year-olds out there, I know you're ready. Uh, we will work towards that. Uh, when I turned 16, there was a giant ice storm. Uh, it had frozen over just about everything, and I was yelling at my parents. Uh, that they wouldn't take me to get my driver's test, even though the office was closed for a week. So um, I understand how badly you want to go and you want to get that test done, um, and, and we're going to work to make sure it's safe. It's got to be safe to the instructor. It's got to be safe to, to you. It is an enclosed space, uh, so we will get there as quickly as we can. I want you to get your license. I don't want you to get COVID. Uh, about the Ohio County testing site, uh, we talked a little bit about that. A question is, if it remains low, will we try to open it up to no appointments? I'll work with Kroger on that. But, folks, I, this is an area that's been hit uh, pretty hard. Uh, we just need people to sign up. And so many Kentuckians live within 30, 45 minutes uh, of this site. It's how we protect one another in that area and across Kentucky. Lawrence? I want to go back to the daycare issue. Clarify the conditions under which these daycare centers will so, be able to operate, and there'll be more guidance, I assume. Right. At some point. So the questions on daycare, we hope to have guidance up by the end of the week. Uh, a lot of it is going to be about the the ten rules, uh, but the other piece is really it's going to come down to number of children um, in any one. You can call it class. You can call it group. Uh, so the challenge. Do you still have the graphic when we showed daycare? Uh, the challenge is that, that daycare, because kids cannot 
socially distance. If you have a smaller group, you can do better uh, with it, but kids have a, a, a tough time of that. This is the choir practice, but that's okay. Um, and, and so uh, the way that you prevent the, the almost exponential spread of contacts is to keep the group as small as we can. Now, we're also going to encourage if specific businesses uh, want to work with specific daycares that does make their employees safer because the employees are already in contact with each other to where if their families are in contact with each other, if you'd run through that, right. This is what we want to avoid. Uh, this is if um, I think a, a family of four, one individual goes back to work and is working with eight coworkers and all their families look the same, which I know in reality, but it helps us with that. And then um, any child goes to um, a child care facility with 32 kids in contact, look at what you move from. I mean, you, you increase the exposure by an amount that we know would cause a spike. So what we've got to do when you look at that children and 32 is to limit that number down uh, so we reduce every number that grows uh, from it. It's, it's the best way we can to try to make um, uh, this as, as uh, the, to make it less risky uh, and to ensure we can also uh, monitor because if it's spread, we don't want to have to shut down, you know, all of these individuals with with the self quarantine. We'd we'd rather make sure that we can keep it small and and that it doesn't ultimately wipe out a business or a or 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 a group for a short period of time. Meaning not being able to go into the office. Uh, contact tracing. Uh, folks want to apply. We like that. We plan to have the information instructions on how to apply to work as a tracer, along with the list of vendors posted on our website uh, very soon. Uh, and we actually think that we will have a couple of other uh, announcements where uh, through different um, uh, things we're having to do to address uh, COVID-19 or uh, other opportunities that are going to be out there, um, more dollars that we hope are coming to uh, rural hospitals really soon, uh, that we hope we're going to see a significant increase in employment there. Joe. So the question is on um, this this pediatric inflammatory syndrome, which I know is not the full name, COVID related that we are seeing across the United States. In Kentucky, to our knowledge, we've only had four cases thus far. It still appears to be rare, but because it trails the original COVID infection by so many weeks, we don't know for sure. And so we are watching this very carefully. And yes, it could very much impact um, uh, uh, child care and youth sports, but I hope everyone would want that if we figure out that it's going to become more widespread than it is. Right now, again, appears to be rare. I don't think it's cause for alarm, but it is cause um, uh, for knowing what to look for, which we're going to continue to talk about because we want any child that could be at risk for their parents or caregivers to know, and that's why we're calling through every uh, minor uh, that has had a positive test and we are going to check on them. Uh, the status, I believe, is, is generally unchanged. Um, the original 10-year-old um, uh, that was intubated is no longer intubated and is getting better, uh, though it's taking some time. Uh, he's still, uh, the child is still uh, not out of the woods, and, and we need to still be uh, concerned. The teenager is home, was only in the hospital for a little bit of time, I believe the five-year-old is also home. And so then we have one more individual who is still in the hospital, who is, ele who is 11. Um, and, and I believe they're, they're still being monitored. I don't think they're in the ICU. They're just in the hospital. Uh, and so all in all, that's really good news, right? There's two things we'll want to know about this. We'll want to know, um, is it rare or is it not? And then we'll want to know the, the severity of it as we go. Let me promise everybody out there, I'm watching this as closely as anybody can. As a dad of a 10 and a 9-year-old, I want to, want to make sure you have all the information uh, on this and that we are fully transparent uh, about the risks. Joe. On well, your list of June 8th reopening, you had outdoor attractions and you had aquariums. Does that include the Louisville Zoo? Uh, so we want to uh, make sure we haven't specifically talked with the Louisville Zoo. 
Uh, we want to make sure that we talk directly with them and get feedback uh, and also the, the community itself. Uh, that's one where uh, we believe with the right, um, uh, the, right, the right practices in place that there can be some pretty significant controls. Uh, but that's, that's one where we need to talk to them directly, uh, given that they are um, the only uh, uh, state-run or, or zoo uh, in the Commonwealth. But, but that's something, especially in the summer months, that if we can do right, uh, we'd like to get opened up. Uh, why do we think we're seeing the spike in ICU cases and hospitalizations? Are we watching them? Uh, you know, it could be for a number of different reasons. We don't have enough data um, uh, to know exactly why uh, we're seeing that right now. We know we've seen clusters, and we also know that every time it gets in a long-term care facility, it's more likely we have somebody on the, the, the ICU. So yes, we're watching that data very, very closely. Um, and, and just to see how severe uh, people's reactions are, it's not just the number of ventilators that we have, because right now we look like we're in really good shape uh, with that. But it's about, um, it's about making sure that we know uh, the current status of, of the virus. And let me, let me mention, because we added ventilators, um, looking back and looking at what a number of other states did, I think we acted very responsibly in our purchases here in Kentucky. Uh, when you look at uh, the amount we spent on PPE, the amount we spent on some ventilators, uh, I believe every single dollar we spent, we actually got the goods that we paid for. Uh, we've seen some other states spend millions or more of dollars of putting that money out uh, before the, the goods came in uh, and sometimes not getting them or not getting what they, what they ordered. Uh, I feel that when we look back, on the way we went about this, uh, uh, people will be um, uh, proud, or 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 they'll they'll see that we we did this uh, very responsibly. Now there were times where it's really tough uh, to get PPE, but uh, we would never allow us to simply send money out uh, to a group without knowing that they actually had uh, what they were saying that that they had. Uh, so I feel like we did that right, even in a very stressful time, where. Every time someone claimed they had a line on PPE, they would say everybody else is, is fronting money. Tom. Um, Warren County is the, is the fifth most populous county, yet it has the second most populous or second highest number of cases. Um, any reason that you're able to track down for the disproportionate? So, so the question is about Warren County, and I think it's a number of factors coming together. This is how clusters can work. Uh, and, and if uh, we're not uh, following all the guidelines, um, if our businesses aren't taking all the steps they need to, uh, a county can have a lot of cases very quickly. And we've seen that in other counties before Warren County, which is just the latest one. Uh, there is a connection to a, a meat packing and processing facility, which we've seen in a number of different places. That doesn't explain uh, all of it. Uh, but, but the challenge is once you have a decent amount, right it can spread that much that much faster uh, so we're, we're going to have these until we have a vaccine or until the virus changes and what we've got to be able to do is react uh, get it right and and we're going to have significant testing uh, in warren county as we continue and and tracing so i know there are folks uh, out there that don't like wearing masks guess what It'll be a lot easier to contain an outbreak in Warren County and other places. Because if you look at the numbers in Warren County, it means there are a lot of people who are asymptomatic. So if they are not wearing a mask, they're spreading the virus. I think Dr. Stack said he thinks up to one in four people across Kentucky could have the virus at any given time and be asymptomatic. Think about that. You got a 25% chance, according to our health professional, of having this and spreading this if you don't wear this. Well, if I wear this 100% of the time when I'm in public, it certainly decreases my chance that I'm that one in four uh, that could be spreading it. And folks, every health professional now is saying to do this. And if you say, well, why weren't we asked to do this two months ago? That's because we were healthy at home and we shut things down. We want to go back to work. We all know that. So this is part of the price that we need to pay to make sure we can do it safely. All right, let's do one lightning round. Lawrence. Retail opens tomorrow, restaurants Friday, 33% mm -hmm. capacity for, for both of those. What will determine when 
they'll be allowed to expand capacity. Question is about when capacity could be expanded, restaurants and retail. Uh, we want to just give enough time to make sure we're doing it well, that the practices are in place, and that the virus is still under uh, control. So you know, we need to go uh, two weeks plus because that would be the, the first day. But if folks prove that we can do this, do this well, it becomes part of our DNA, then we'll absolutely increase capacity over time. But remember, doing it gradually uh, helps us with the contact tracing, with the testing, uh, and, and with our, our levels of, of hospital beds and, and the ICU. Gradual means safe uh, in a reopening in a time of, of coronavirus. And you know, if other people open a lot faster and they don't see that spike, good for them. I don't want their people harmed, but it's a level of risk that we run for that because when you spike uh, and in, a, in a region, you, you run out of capacity, more people die than, than need to or should. Joe. Yes. So most of the, the June 8th um, uh, capacity openings will be 33 percent similar and then individual groups needing to be 10 and under just like the guidance is. So if you're an outdoor attraction, you'll have an overall capacity and one group that may come through for a tour uh, you pick has got to be 10 and under. Think about distillery to tours. Uh, while there'll be specific guidance and they submitted a lot of that, that'll be a large part of it. Other Joe. Uh, can restaurants use reusable tablecloths and napkins if they are professionally cleaned, or is the guidance to not use them at all? I'm going to need to get you a, 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 an answer on that. It's about restaurants and professionally cleaned uh, utensil and, and tablecloths. I know the guidance there uh, is one that uh, is incredibly important. Uh, if there is a way uh, to, to safely do it a different way, uh, we can look at that, but it'd have to be after every um, uh, person, uh, every individual. Because if you think about, you know, people like, I, I guess, their, their tablecloths, um, their cloth or linen ta uh, uh, tablecloths, but one person sits down and they touch it, which you'll always do at the table. You can't sit down at a table without touching the table. It's almost impossible. The next person who comes up can get the virus from that. So. We're just trying to make sure we think through, we do it right. Uh, but if there are methods out there where people can do it safely, we want to hear about them. Tom. The court system will be opening up shortly. Mm -hmm. You saw the, the Chief Justice said today. Um, will you be lifting your ban on evictions, or are you going to hold on to that until the time? Well, the, the, we are not going to uh, let up on our uh, ban on evictions. Uh, certainly in the next uh, couple weeks, uh, we're going to watch. Uh, as reopenings occur. The challenge is you still need to be healthy at home. Even though you're healthy at work, if you don't have a home to come home to, uh, it's really hard to be safe, healthy, and not spread the virus. And we're still in the middle of a pandemic, and it's still uh, very important. All right, so for the rest of the week, um, up through Friday, we're going to be here. Uh, we have made a request, and I think it's, it's granted. Uh, we're we're going to start moving uh, this around a little bit. I want to show you uh, important buildings and rooms and facilities across Frankfurt, and maybe we'll even move a little bit uh, as things open up across Kentucky. Next week, uh, it's my hope that we're going to be in the Supreme Court chamber. Uh, it's a, one of the most beautiful buildings uh, here. It allow us to have a little bit more uh, press. It is a bigger room, and I want the people at home to see where the highest court serves and does uh, their good work. All right, so a big week, folks, and one that I know that we have all waited for, and you ought to be hopeful and optimistic going forward, but we also ought to be careful. Now, that's one of our, we talk about being compassionate and kind. We also need to be careful. Let's make sure that our excitement about Memorial Day, about retail, and about restaurants doesn't transition into a spike. Let's do it in moderation, uh, and let's do it uh, right. Uh, so, uh, well, no video today. Uh, we'll see everybody at 5 o'clock tomorrow. Be safe, be healthy, be healthy at home, be healthy at work. God bless. Good night.